Thank you, Paige. If you have a copy of the scriptures, Job 27, and we're actually going to cover a lot of territory this morning all the way to chapter 37. That's uh, 10 plus chapters of scripture, and so we've got some groundwork to do uh, this Mother's Day. Uh, welcome once again to Journey Church. My name is Daniel. I get the opportunity to serve here as one of the pastors and teach God's word uh, today. And just a small word on Mother's Day before we dive into the scriptures. I just want to say happy Mother's Day first to the moms of Journey Church. I hope today is uh, special, special for you. For all the moms that are connected here in a variety of ways, I hope that today reminds you of the joys of motherhood. This is a worthy calling. This is a worthy calling to invest so much of yourself into so uh, many individuals and uh, the lives of your children. And I hope today that you know that you are seen and loved by your church family. To the spiritual mothers uh, and sisters of Journey Church, uh, today, I want you to know that our church would not be complete without you. The primary illustration of the local body of the people of God in the New Testament is family. And families have mothers and sisters and daughters, as well as fathers and brothers. And here at Journey Church, we desire each and every one of our moms and sisters to be active and a valuable part of our church family by being faithful witnesses inside and outside of our church gathering times, by being sharp theologically, actively teaching and fellow and serving their fellow brothers and sisters and children in the faith. And lastly, to those of you who are hurting today for a variety of reasons, hurting because of loss of your physical mother, hurting because you have lost a child or are struggling to be a physical mother, or maybe because you didn't have the greatest example of a mother and you're grieving the relationship that you never had the opportunity to seize. Today, I hope you know that you are seen, loved, and highly valued, not only in our church family, but in the eyes of God. And in this difficult season, you have the opportunity to cling to the Lord and his faithfulness in ways that in other seasons you'd have not. Today, I hope you rest in his love, his perfect plan over your life, that you delight in his beauty, his presence, and despite these trials, know with confidence he is always holding your hand. Would you allow me to pray over you this morning? Father God, to the mothers of Journey Church, to the, our spiritual mothers and sisters, and those who are hurting today, God, we pray that they feel immensely seen, valued, and loved today. God, may our church body be a physical and tangible extension of your love. And God, today, for those who struggled to come and are here, we are grateful for them. God, we pray that you would speak through your word and you would allow us all to see the beauty in your scripture. In Christ's name, amen. We are in week six of a series that we've titled Amidst Pain. Through this series, we've been walking through the Old Testament book of Job. And we have covered some territory up to this point. We've walked through the man Job in week one and two, when we've seen that Job has lost every earthly reason to be connected to God in relationship, still yet he is being faithful. In weeks three through five, we walked through each one of Job's friends of how they were terrible examples of how to help those who are in pain. And then this week, we are in one last exchange before God speaks. This is very simple. In 27 through 31, Job talks. And in 32 through 37, Elihu, this random friend who shows up on the scene, speaks. And in Job's final speech, what we get to see is his unwavering faithfulness to God and how he defends himself in a lot of ways. And so there's one major idea that I want each of us to grasp onto this morning as we look at the scripture together. And the first one is this. This is the one big idea. There's going to be many things on the screen, but here's your one big idea. Don't use suffering as a reason to walk away from Jesus. Don't use suffering as a reason to walk away from Jesus. And what we're going to see is this in a twofold way. First, we're going to see Job's response in all of his speech. And so I'm going to kind of uh, grab a few of these key scriptures from 27 and 31 um, of how Job defends his own case. And then second, what you're going to see in Elihu is this random individual that seems to kind of pop up on the scene, but Job isn't shocked to hear him talk. He must have been there listening to 
all three friends and hear Job's response, is you're going to see how Elihu views the character of God and why there, those two reasons are reason enough for you and I not to use our suffering as a reason to walk away from Jesus. From Job's perspective, he shares with us how to keep the faith amidst the pain. Job 27, I'm going to read 1 through 6 again. Job continued to speak. I vow by the living God who has taken away my rights, by the Almighty who has embittered my soul, as long as I live, while I have breath from God, my lips will speak no evil, my tongue will speak no lies, I will never concede that you are right. I will defend my integrity until I die. I will maintain my innocence without wavering. My conscience is clear for as long as I live. So why could Job say this with such confidence? That his conscience is clear, that he has a scot clear integrity? Is he saying that he is sinless? No, he's not. But essentially what Job is saying by his integrity is he's saying that he has done nothing to earn this level of suffering from God. And so he says that I follow God. I've I've stayed true to my word. I've, I've stayed true to who God is. You see, before we dive into what Job does to defend his innocence, we have to have this firm grasp on where Job gets the foundation for his integrity. Because if we miss the foundation for Job's integrity, we'll walk away thinking, well, I can just be good enough to earn favor with God. Because what Job allows us to see is it's not necessarily his integrity, because when he jumps into chapter 28, he goes into this whole chapter that sounds a lot like the book of Proverbs. And in Job chapter 28, he talks about wisdom and understanding and insight for life. And he says this verse in chapter 12 or chapter 28, verse 12, he says, but do people know where to find wisdom? Where can they find understanding? No one knows where to find it for it is not found among the living. You see what Job dives into here is the reality is in chapter 28 is it's only the fear of the Lord that is the foundation for his integrity. It's following God faithfully that is the foundation for Job's integrity, which is the last verse, which has been hanging out there, Job 28, 28. It says, and this is what he says to all humanity. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. You see that all the integrity that Job has spoke about all throughout this book is the integrity that is rooted in a relationship with the Lord. It's an integrity that is that is able to withstand and face pain head on. So how does Job understand and trust in the wisdom of the Lord? Because what Job is going to share with us in Job 31 is I've broken this down into five categories of where Job tangibly expresses the wisdom of the Lord playing out in his life in real time. In Job chapter 31, he takes from chapter 28, the fear of the Lord, and and, and he almost answers this question, what's that going to look like in my life? And he says, this is what it looks like. When I'm saying that I'm standing on my integrity, let me share with you how. And to all these friends that are ultimately his tormentors, he shares with them how integrity has fleshed itself out in his life. So this is a twofold response. So first we're in Job's response. And here's the five resolutions of a pure heart. That's what I'm kind of calling this. Five resolutions of a pure heart. First one, predecide to guard the eyes. Predecide to guard the eyes. Job 31, one says it like this. I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Integrity for Job in this moment comes before the moment. Let me say that again. Integrity for Job comes before the moment. What integrity looks like for Job is saying integrity is not something that happens by accident. Integrity is pursued. It's developed. It's deeply desired and it's wanted. And for those who are willing, integrity is doing what is right when no one else is watching. 
You see, integrity is the predecision that helps in a moment of decision. Let me say it again. Integrity is the predecision that helps in a moment of decision. Job says, I've predecided how I'm going to respond in this given moment. Moment. You see, this application spans beyond the application of lust. You see, Job talks about guarding his eyes, but he says, essentially, I've predecided how I'm going to respond in this moment of opportunity, the opportunity to sin or the opportunity to please God. And this could apply in any situation in your life, whatever your struggle is, whatever it looks like. You could predecide of how I'm going to respond in any given moment. And the predecision helps in a moment of decision. So Job shares first, he says, I know exactly how I'm going to act in this opportunity. The second one is, Job says, I practice honesty. You see, these build off each other. You see, he can't just say, I'm going to have integrity, but then never share when life is difficult and challenging and sin actually does creep up in his life. In verses five and six, he says this, He says, have I lied to anyone or deceived anyone? Let God weigh in on me, the scales of justice, for he knows my integrity. He says, may God be able to search my heart to know if I've ever actually not been honest. You see, integrity and honesty are synonymous. It's telling the truth. It's telling the truth in a difficult situation. It's the confession of sin with trusted people. You see, the scripture says that that we will be healed when we confess our sins to one another. You see, many of us are very comfortable with confessing our sins to God because it's almost like we're talking to the sky. It's like, oh, well, no one else has to know that we're comfortable with the weight of guilt between us and God because we still get to keep it to ourselves at some level. But to expose ourselves to one another and allow us to be held accountable between not only God, but each other is challenging. It's challenging for many of us to be open ourselves up to actually be vulnerable with one another. But what Job says is he says, I'm open not only to God, but also to my fellow man. I'm willing to be honest. You see, it's not about an unspoken prayer request, but about a real confession of guilt and how we failed that we need in our life to be healed. Third thing Job says, he says, I denounce any compromise. I denounce any compromise. And Job actually goes in with a lot of different explanations on this. And so I kind of summarized these in just these five categories, but here's the list that Job shares. The first one is he says, the moral compromise of sexual sin in verse 19. In verses 26 through 28, he talks about spiritual compromises, that he does not deny his God nor any true doctrine. Job denies hiding any sin in verse 33. He says, I'm honest, unlike Adam in the very beginning of the scriptures who hid from God in the midst of his sin. He says, I'm honest before God. I'm honest before man. I have decided I denounce any compromise in my life. And in the end, in verses 35 and 24 and 25, he says, I deny any access to greed in my heart. He says, I deny any motivation for materialism. So Job says, I denounce any compromise in my life. You see, these aren't just struggles for Job, but they're struggles for all of us. We can practice guarding our life and our heart from each one of these. Because trying to have the right answer on how do we respond in any situation is difficult and it's challenging. But what we can see in these is not just a man who has these check boxes in his life of like, all right, I'm going to check all the right boxes so God will love me. That's not it at all. You see, for Job, for Job to have each and every one of these as a priority in his life, this is a man who understands where life is found. That was one of the main reasons that we studied the book of Job. is because this is not just a man who says, I'm going to do what's right, even when it's hard. But Job for us is an example of an individual who has settled deep in his heart already. I know where life is found, like value, meaning, and purpose. I know where that's found. Therefore, these decisions, even though they're difficult, I know I can follow through because I know that life is found 
in being connected with my God. You see this in number four, is you see how this outward expression carries in Job's life. The four is Job says, I've decided to defend and give to those in need. In verses 13 through really 22, Job says that he'll treat all people fair. Job says that he'll give to those in need. Job says he has and he will care for widows and orphans. You see, Job decided, I'm not gonna make moral compromises in my heart or with my life, and I'm not gonna hoard things to be mine. I'm gonna give to those in need. And the fifth and final thing is Job says, I will display compassion to others. I will display compassion to others. Integrity is not only displayed in the inward workings of an individual, but also how they live their life outward facing as well. It's a diving down deep into the heart, but it's also what is the fruit of your life show? Job basically says this, I've determined to set pure boundaries. I've determined to develop honesty in my life. I've determined that I will not allow any moral compromises. I will defend those who are disadvantaged. I will distribute to the needy. I will deplore materialism and I will never trust in money for my security. I will denounce any spiritual compromise. I will display compassion towards other people. I will decline hypocrisy in all things. I will deny any excuse for greed in my life. Job chapter 31 is filled with how Job views the integrity of the heart and the hands in his life. And if you notice, Job saturated his life. He says that I will allow my God to rule over my thoughts, my ethics, my work, my home, my community, my finances, my testimony, my relationships, and my stewardship. He said, there's not a nook or cranny in my life where my God does not have control and reign over me. That it's not this spirituality that sits in this box over here in the corner. But what Job says, in my life, God has it all. In my life, God has oversight of all areas of my life. And in the end, Job stops speaking. Job's done after that. After the end of 31, it literally says, and Job shut his mouth. But then all of a sudden, another guy speaks. A random friend who is really the only Hebrew in this story, the only Israelite in this story, Elihu. Elihu speaks seemingly from nowhere. We didn't know that he was in the, he's not included in the three friends. He's not rebuked in Job 42 by God, but he just kind of shows up and starts talking and he's mad. He's real mad. He's mad at Job for defending himself and not just saying, Job, you should have just said, I'm a sinner. You're right. I confess. I had this hidden sin in my life. Like that's really what he wanted Job to do. He's mad at the three friends because they don't have an answer for Job. After this long speech from 27 to 31, they're like, well, he kind of said it all. I don't know how to reply to this one. And Elihu is frustrated the friends for that. But these good friends don't have any wisdom to give Job, but apparently Elihu gets some things right and he comforts Job in a unique way. Because what Elihu gets right and strengthen Job's heart is, is how he talks about the character of God. Now, he doesn't get everything right, but he does talk about the character of God in pretty spot on ways. And so the, really, we can categorize these into two primary categories. And the first one is this. The truth about God in our pain is number one, in times of confusion, God is still speaking. In times of confusion, God is still speaking. In your life and in my life, in times of confusion, God is still speaking. This is what Elihu tells Job in Job 33, 13 through 18. Why does he say, why say he does not respond to people's complaints? For God speaks again and again through people do not recognize. He speaks in dreams and in visions at night when deep sleep falls over people as they lie in their beds. He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes them turn from doing wrong and keeps them from pride. He protects them from the grave and from crossing over from the river of death. You see, Elihu is confident that God is at work in all things. Elihu is confident that God will communicate and we as his people just need to listen. Now, the question you might have is like, okay, well, is this scripture still true today? 
Like, is God going to scare me in my dreams at night? Well, that's a challenging question. But the New Testament speaks of it like this. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, the confidence of the testimony of Scripture is found fully in Jesus, that God has revealed himself fully in the person of Christ and in his word. That's what Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says. Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to the son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son, this is S-O-N, by the way. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. He sustains everything by his mighty power and by mighty power of his command. And when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of God, of the majesty of God in heaven. This shows that the son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God gave him is greater than their names. So question of answer is this, is that God has spoken to us clearly and definitely in Christ. And if we are con- confused at any times about who God is or how he works in times of trouble, we look to Christ. We dive into scripture. You see, the second thing is about the character of God that Elihu gets right in chapter 34 is number two is God is never unjust nor heartless. See, this is confidence in the character of God, even in times of difficulty. You see, Elihu describes certain truths about God that we can hang our hat on. The first thing is in verse 11, he says, he is a just rewarder. You and I, we play favorites, but God doesn't. God is a just rewarder. He is sovereign over authority. That's verse 13 of chapter 34. You see, we show partiality, but God never has. He is not only a just rewarder, but he is sovereign in his authority. And he always makes the right decision. When we tip the scales, God's scales of justice are perfectly balanced. You see, he is independent. And he is the sustainer of all life. That's verses 14 and 15. He is the impartial ruler. You see, the reality is our God. We skew the scales of justice, but our God never does. He judges everyone with the perfect scales of his justice, his holiness, and ultimately his judgment. Listen to verse 19 of Job 34, where it says this. He doesn't care how great a person may be, and he pays no more attention to the rich than the poor. He made them all. You see, if we can bank on this guy, we can bank on the character of our God, who is fair, just, impartial, holy, loving, kind, powerful, and a ruler over all. So what do we do with this? What do we do with the, truths about who our God is and the resolutions that Job made at the front. Well, how do we apply these in our life in a real practical way? Well, let me ask you three questions of how this will hit home for each one of us. The first question is this. So does this mean that God is potentially silent in my pain? No. No, God is not silent. He is actually communicating to each of us right now through his word and through the power of his Holy Spirit. But where in your life and in my life has his encouragement either been ignored, has been overlooked, or missed for you and I? Let me say that again. In your life and in my life, God is communicating. But where has his encouragement and love been ignored, overlooked, or missed in your life and mine? Second question, is God ever unfair at all? Be reminded that our God is never unjust. He will make everything right in due time. Stand with confidence based on who he is, that he is keeping a record of every right and wrong done on this earth, and he will make every wrong right in his righteous, precise judgment of timing. He will make all things new in his own timing. We'll soon discover a fresh definition 
of fairness. For if God were fair like us, it wouldn't actually be fair at all. But he is in control and coming again. Last question, number three. Is God in control in your life during times of pain? Is God actually really in control in your life or my life during times of pain? It's probably the hardest question. It's probably the most challenging. It's the one that hits the closest. Okay, God can be speaking. Okay, he's fair. And one day he'll make everything right. But is he actually in control in your life and in my life when things aren't going the way we think they should? The answer is yes. He is still on the throne. My wife and I, we did ministry in New York State for just over three years. And there was an elderly man in our church who had been through a lot in his life. And over those three years, I got to know him more and more closely. And every Sunday morning, I would see him, I would greet him and say, hey, how are you doing today? And without fail, and without a doubt, no matter what his day had been or his week had been or what he experienced that given day, he always answered exactly the same. He would simply reply, he's still on the throne. He would simply reply, he's still on the throne. And simply what he meant by that is it didn't matter what had been in his life or in our world or in our city or in our country that given day or that given week or that given month, he had confidence that Jesus was still sitting on the throne, that your life and my life may feel unsettled, but God is never unseated. That your life and my life may feel unsettled, but he is never unseated. That his kingdom is forever and ever. And even now, he is sitting on the throne. He reigns supreme. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who is most well known for his role in the uh, plot to overthrow Hitler, said this, God does not give us everything we want but he does fulfill his promises, leading us along the best and straightest paths to himself. See, our God is leading us to closer and closer intimacy with him. It's what we need in our life. The psalmist wrote this in the longest chapter in the scripture, Psalm 119, verse 71. My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Your instructions are more valuable to me than a millions in gold and silver. May we learn to value the plan of God like that. Paul writes the words of Jesus in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 about suffering. When Paul had been praying for this thing in his life to be removed, he calls it a thorn in his flesh and it doesn't get removed. But he quotes the words of Jesus to him, and he writes it in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so the power of Christ can work through me. I don't know what it is you're going through this week, this day, this hour, but I know that suffering is not a reason to walk away from Jesus, that we can make resolutions in a pure heart to say, this is what it looks like to walk it out, even in times of difficulty. We know the story of Job as it's been that he lost every earthly reason to maintain his integrity or to maintain his relationship with God, but he still chose to stay faithful to God, even when it felt like God had left him. But we know that wasn't true. And Job, by the end of the story, will realize that isn't true. That even though it felt like it, that in all of Job's weakness and all of Job's suffering, he was being used in a powerful way by God. And we get to celebrate his testimony of faithfulness thousands of years later. So I don't know what it is you're going through, but could you make resolutions of a pure heart to Maintain your integrity even in the face of this difficulty. And maybe if you can't do that, can you trust in the character of God? That he's never unfair. He's never unjust. He's always faithful. And he's still on the throne. 
No matter what it is that you're going through, could you learn to trust in a Savior who's making all things new? And He desires to work in your story. He desires to work in your life. And He's working in such a way, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, to draw you unto Himself. How is God in your weakness or in your pain right now in this moment in your life working so that you may know him more closely? Know him more intimately. Not just know facts about him, not just know some stats or some Bible verses, but genuinely know him for who he is and how he works. And then no matter what may come or what may go in your life, you can sit and say with confidence, I know who my God is and he is working even though I can't see it, even though I can't feel it right now in my life and in our world. Would you pray with me and then we'll sing a few more songs in response of worship. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Job. And God, we pray that with these difficult truths of trusting you, even when it doesn't make sense or when we don't understand, that we could learn, that you would teach us what it means to genuinely know you, trust you, and walk with you through the mountaintop and valley moments of our lives. God, would you teach us how to apply these truths to make the resolutions of integrity inward and how they move outward in our lives so that we may point a dying world to you. In Jesus' name, amen.